Good afternoon and welcome to the second session of the sixth day of Brain Awareness Week 2020, conducted by Gujarat Forensic Science University and organized by Dana Foundation and Google. I am Ann Paul, presently University Master's in Psychology from Gujarat Forensic Science University and the moderator for the session titled Touch, Tickle and Poke. The Neuroscience of Tactile Sensory System. The session will be conducted by Dr. Leslie Yasser. He is a faculty member in the Center for Cognitive Science at IIT Gandhinagar. He secured his doctoral degree from Neuroscience National Brain Research Center and completed his postdoctoral fellowship from Howard Medical School, Boston, USA. His research interests are in understanding multimodal touch perception in humans. We are so glad to have you here, sir. Thank you for joining, and uh, I now ask her to take over. Okay. All right, so I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. Okay, can you hear me, Anne? Yes, sir, I can hear you. Okay. So I'll start now. So this is a very strange talk that I'm giving because this is the first time I'm giving this kind of a webinar over the internet. And I don't know if you know, I cannot see myself. So I'm basically this guy sitting in the room talking to his laptop. So uh, I'm, I'm afraid I might get bored in the middle because in, usually when you give talks, it's kind of exhilarating. You're standing in front of so many people and it's very interactive. But I think the topic is very pertinent now because uh, touch, tickle and poke are the three things you're not supposed to do now because of the pandemic. And so maybe it is time to sort of look deeper into this sensory system. Um, so neuroscientists study perception, right? They want to understand how the brain and how the nervous system and the cognitive systems make sense of the world. And we study different modalities. Modality means, you know, the visual system. We might study the motor system to see how movement is generated. We might study emotions. So because of the modular organization, you can sort of specialize in different systems. And I specialized in the somatosensory system. For my PhD, I recorded from cells that were responsive uh, to touch in from the monkey brain. And right now I'm doing psychophysical experiments in humans to understand touch. So um, with that background, the reason I put together this talk is to sort of give you an understanding and an overview of the richness of this sensory system. So um, what happens is that um, the tactile system tends to take a back seat to visual system in terms of research and even thinking about perception. And the reasons are many. I mean, uh, it's um, so we have this concept of dominance, right? So among the sensory system, the visual is supposed to be dominant. And uh, there again, the reasons are many. I'm not here to have a debate or to fight or create a fight between the visual and the touch system and say, you know, this is close. That's not the point at all. I'm not even going to question the hierarchy of visual of, of sensory dominance. What I want to put across is that the tactile system is very rich. And if we think in terms of this system, perhaps we can understand perception in a deeper way. That's for the larger perspective. But also to understand the nuances of this system itself, because it's just not touch. It's got a lot of submodalities that people generally don't think of when they think of touch. And it's woefully under-researched. And so I thought this is an opportunity for students and everyone to get an idea as to what tactile sensory systems are. So um, I wanted to put this quote from Merlu Ponty, who's a great phenomenologist. So He's talking about vision, which everybody assumes is that we are visual animals and everything. So through vision, we touch the sun and the stars. So what he's alluding to here is that 
touch is somewhat primary okay and then vision is some kind of an extension of this perceptual system which is letting us see things that are far away and get some kind of perceptual understanding which we can only understand through the language of the tactile system okay so um so so merleau ponty actually um spoke a lot about tactile systems okay and i will i have dedicated one slide for this philosophical understanding of how to uh, look at the tactile system but there's only one slide so don't 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 think it's going to be you know some dry and boring stuff uh, the reason is the reason why i did that is we need these philosophical underlying assumptions on which we stand and then we record from you know different parts of the brain and add evidence to these stories you just don't start on day one and say okay i'm going to record from this neuron and then this is how it makes sense no we all stand on these philosophical underpinnings and let's try and see what they are i've picked one particular aspect to show that tactile systems are a little better or different in terms of studying perception before i do that i want to get everybody on board with the different varieties of touch i keep saying touch and tactile system and i use them interchangeably what do these encompass okay so the most basic thing is touch is the mechanical deformation of the skin right anything even if it's like a few nanometers there's wind blowing you're able to detect it as, as touch it's basically mechanical deformation there's nothing more to it but when you think in terms of how do you feel pressure you not only get this uh, mechanical deformation but you also get this additional percept of this weight that is being pushed so you are able to perceive something that is the hard push and a light push right but the event that is happening on your skin is the same that is the mechanical deformation then you are able to detect different things like hardness and softness you know compliance and all those kinds of percepts your textures and all those things and vibration is also very interesting because every time you phone uh, vibrates you know you kept it in a particular setting you can easily distinguish between different kinds of vibrations but essentially it's still the mechanical deformation of the skin but done in a very periodic manner in it's a regular push and pull and if you increase the number of push and pull across time then you have more high frequency vibrations which we perceive as something else and low frequency vibrations are something else so as you see just by um changing the dynamics of the stimuli we are able to perceive a lot of different percepts and the skin also detects temperature which is not the same as mechanical deformation right that's a completely different class of detectors that it needs and you're able to obviously if the ac is too cold or the sun is too hot like how it is now in gujarat you can easily detect temperature itch and pain they are mostly chemical senses in many ways the receptors that detect are detecting some kind of chemicals that are released in your in your skin and in your um uh, and then you get this percept of pain and itch um stickiness is a very uh, complex confusing percept we don't know why we feel this stickiness it's got to do with the viscosity we are able to perceive certain uh, liquids as viscous and some as very free flowing and proprioception is uh the quintessential silent sense you know we are always aware of our limb position we might not be consciously aware of it but you know right now i'm i'm sitting on my chair and you know if i slip i am making some corrections and all that is happening because you know in the background the brain is completely aware of how my body position is in space and how i should balance myself and uh, how i should not slip and fall all that is happening because of proprioception and kinesthesia is the sense when you get your your tactile sensation which is 
uh, along with the limb movement. If I ask you to touch something that is novel or you want to detect some kind of texture, right? You always move your skin over it. And every time you move your hand, your skin also stretches. So that also is the touch event. OK, so that is kinesthesia. And stereognosis is, is the ability to detect shapes just using touch and movements. So you're putting your hand inside your pocket to you know, take out your car keys. Your house keys, you're able to, if your house keys are also in the pocket, without using vision, you're able to figure out which is your car key and which is your house keys. And you're able to pull out the right one. That is stereognosis. OK, so this is a non-exhaustive list. I'm sure I've missed a few things, but we will um, we will sort of move from here and uh, go to different percepts of touch and try and understand how they're being constructed in the brain using uh, using the mechanisms of the somatosensory system. And we'll also look at social touch and higher level touch, which really cannot be explained by these bottom up approaches, but we'll still see what that is. So I want to now go back to the philosophical argument as to the problems with, with us being considered as visual animals. Like I said, my contention is not to argue saying, oh, you know, vision is more important. I, I mean, I don't know how to argue against it or we use vision more prominently. I mean, I don't know. But this is very specific. So what happens in studying vision is that we tend to think that the cognitive and perceptual mechanisms work like vision. OK, we gain access to the outside world by seeing and we get a view of the world. So you see, all these are visual metaphors. OK, and vision makes us perceive the world voyeuristically as a spectacle in front of us, and it misses the background sense of participation that is integral to all perception and cognition, but touch doesn't deny the experience. So what we are trying to say is that perception is sort of detached from this whole feeling of being immersed in the environment, of being participating in this perceptual process, which happens very much in vision because you can see it till infinity, right? You can see very, very far away. And so you tend to make this mistake that the world outside, you know, is sort of, you know, given to you in a platter like that. But that's not how perception occurs. Now, let's take a look at how we will deal with this problem with the tactile stuff. So touch cannot be perceived without closely associated with or partly constitution by the perception of the body. Right, because we're using the skin, which is the outer edge of the body, one cannot perceive the world without perceiving ourselves in the process. So you see the difference between vision and touch. So touch is partly constitutive of the sense of reality and belonging. Hence, touch has a kind of phenomenological primacy over other senses. So this is what Melopanti was talking about. The touch is you know, sort of rooted, it, it sort of sets you in space, it gives you the sense of, you know, uh, reality and participation in the world in which you are perceiving certain things. So this might seem like a very dry philosophical point. But if you look at the literature and architecture, or even the culture of architecture, right, we always judge buildings based on the visual modality. If you want to build a huge building, people are asked to submit their plans. They're all visual. And a lot of people design for the visual realm. But that's not how you actually experience architecture. OK, you are inside it. You feel the temperature. You feel the textures. You, you feel it sort of in an embodied sort of manner. So there is this thinker called uh, Yohani Palasma. And he wrote this amazing book called The Eyes of the Skin. So here he says that against the hegemony of vision, sorry, uh, so here is he says, it is clear that only the distancing and detaching sense of vision is capable of a nihilistic attitude. 
so here he he talks about these buildings that are very uh, brutalistic you know they they are like these glass facades they're huge they look good but they're really not warm they're not easily livable hmm? so he argues for moving away from this visual way of engaging with the world and it says that it is impossible to think of a nihilistic sense of touch oops i have to of touch for instance because the unavoidable nearness intimacy veracity and identification that the sense of touch carries so so according to yohani palasma right touch is a very uh, is a sense it, 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 it's it's a sense that is very much um embodied in its nearness and it always is you know an intimate sense and it's he says veracity and also truth which is not what we generally agree we want to see things okay we want to see things to confirm that is true and that is why he's got the doubting thomas in the in the in the first page of his book but doubting thomas he doesn't believe that that person has an injury is it jesus has injuries risen from he actually wants to go touch and see so here is a great example of where touch take precedence for the veracity now okay i know we are going into philosophical and you know interpretation of buildings but i i, I promise you this is a neuroscience talk i promise that i will show you brain scans and i will but we have to understand the nearness and intimacy of touch okay and this was shown in um patients and in animals that did not get a normal touch during their development so what they found out is that if you deprive the child of touch during development then you have long lasting defects across the whole life you would have immunologically compromised kids would be sick they would show high amounts of anxiety high amounts of aggression high amounts of self soothing behavior in you know, or talking to themselves or touching themselves they will be very withdrawn and they will be very um depressed so if you were to remove vision from the early childhood they will not have that much of a you know effect on the adult life in fact there were experiments done in india actually where um, kids grew up blind till they were 12 years old and then they realized that uh, they had cataracts on their eyes and that's why they were blind and as you know cataracts are very easily uh, treatable uh, disease and so they did the surgery and they found out that the kids were pretty normal they did not have any psychological issues like how you would get if if touch was deprived okay so now the question is um why is this happening before we come to that um this was explained or this was this was this idea was proved by these experiments by harry harry handler and what he did was this is probably the most cruelest experiment so he took newborn monkeys and he removed them from their mother and he uh, sort of reared them without any touch all right so the reason why he did that was that at that point in time in the 60s right in the 50s and 60s was the heydays of behavioralism and people tend to people at that time scientists believe that you really do not require love you know they use the word attachment for love they only believed that the mother and the child had a bond because of an associated bond because the mother is giving them food okay so what he did was he made these two surrogate mothers for this socially isolated monkey and one was a wire mother another one was using a terry cloth so it is very huggable so this baby monkey would go get the food here and then it would always spend its time here so if you remove this the monkey will withdraw further and it would have further defects okay so these experiments he did to show 
that you not only need just food but you also need touch because at those times the practice was to separate the children and put them in orphanages or put them in in, in foster homes where they would grow up in a very aseptic condition without any touch even parents were instructed to not touch their children because they do not want to make them too soft okay so these experiments showed that touch was very much important actually the monkey prefers the touch more than food and that if you do not give this touch the monkey and the humans like children in romanian orphanages in the 90s had long lasting problems all through their life now obviously in the romanian orphanages it's not just the lack of touch there was also food and you know low uh, you know temperature freezing freezing they didn't have money for heating but touch also is a major component so now you have something called the kangaroo care where you know preterm babies are made to touch and one silver lining for this story is that in romanian orphanages if you spend one or two hours touching these children who are deprived they get back to the normal milestone of development so um, how is this really happening for this we have to move to studies done in rats so rats also groom their young like here where it's you know licking the uh, uh, licking its pup so there are two kinds of parenting behavior like any behavior there's a there's a continuum there's low grooming and there's high grooming so pups that were grown to low grooming mothers had very high level of stress hormones and they grew up to have all these developmental deficits like you know depression anxiety and they will not show normal behavior as a normal pup now what is interesting is that they also grew up to become mothers as a low grooming mother so this somewhat reflects our social understanding also right in our society also you have children born into you know um, you know aggressive you know no touch very problematic uh, you know situation and then they grew up to become the same thing so people used to think it was you know encoded in genes those people have to be like that but here to disprove that they did this clever experiment when they switched they fostered they took the pups from the low grooming uh, mother and put it along with the group of a uh, high grooming mother and those pups grew up to become high grooming mothers and their children were okay so what this shows is that this whole touching the licking process changes the genetics of this pup so in the future also it becomes a high grooming mother and it has been shown that these uh, corticosteroid uh, genes they have an epigenetic mechanism that are activated and not activated based on the grooming mechanism so um so i hope this sort of gives you an idea of the the importance of touch in terms of bonding between individuals okay so when you think of a uh, touch and the skin through which we do the touch you can call it like a social organ okay and touch is the communication that we do between individuals so that there is bonding and so that there are some kind of influences in terms of monkeys is fairly straightforward okay so robin dunbar who proposed this idea of uh, the social brain okay so he said that amount of grooming is much more needed than to keep the fur clean so that was the first observation when he was studying um, uh, i think he was studying uh, it definitely was not studying monkeys he was studying apes in africa and so he noticed that the amount of grooming correlated with the size of the troop and that grooming establishes and maintains some kind of social connections what that means is that you groom the animals that are more genetically linked to you okay you you would groom closer relatives more than further away and in terms of getting favors in terms of getting food in terms of getting sexual favors all that currency is made through grooming and through touch this is not isolate this is not only for hairy animals because you know we also i'll show you that we also do that and now i thought 
because you know we are doing we are suffering because of the pandemic i'll also tell you a story about these costa rican bats so bats also have this uh, you know grooming and using touch as social currency so these bats like any other bats they only can have a liquid diet because their throats are really small so what they do every night they will fly and then they will find some animals and they will suck the blood out which is their food and then they they have a lot of blood that they keep in their uh, i think near their buccal cavity and then they come back to the tree in which there is a colony of bats and they always groom each other if you can see here they will groom each other so they notice that if a bat is spending a lot of time grooming another one then it's more likely to share his blood meal with this conspecific whom the grooming is happening so here there is a direct correlation between you know food and touch this is also seen in humans there's a lot of studies which are correlating the amount of touch to um, benefits of social life doctors who touch their patients are always rated to be more empathetic waiters get bigger tips coworkers so this is this concept is called midas touch and there's plenty of studies that show that if you know if you have more touch with another person not any kind of touch also um, so the quality of touch also matters i think you all know that so children as young as few months old they are also known to avert their eyes for rude touch so you need to have this kind of a gentle we call that affective touch and that increases this uh, social communication between people and rewards so uh, you know this is an interesting study where they did where they saw the amount of touch between basketball players in the nba in the 2008 and 2009 season so these scientists sat and watched all the games for research purposes and then they counted the number of touch events happening between the teammates they found that the winning team always touched each other more okay take what you might from this uh, from this study it's a correlation study but but i think by now you are sort of convinced that touch is not just you know finding your car keys or you know you know these tactile events that are happening in the skin but it affects a lot more it affects pretty much our development you know it it affects our social relationships and also you can extrapolate this touch and say that some touch can occur without even touching so we perceive a touch to another person okay as a touch to us so coming to the brain scans so i hope you know that this is an mri of uh, fmri uh, of a human brain so this is the top view of the brain that is if you cut the brain and then you look from on top of another person so this is looking from the back and this is looking from the side so this is the ear hole this is the eye and this is the brain so in this experiment people were given emotional touch they were gently stroked okay and in the other condition they were asked to look at a video of the same touch is being given to another person now the same area in the brain is getting activated so this red is for feeling the touch and blue is for feeling is for seeing the touch and as you can see so these uh, areas that are demarcated in the colored uh, you know in the colored area means that that particular part of the brain sort of uh, activates meaning it, uh, it its neurons there fire a lot more when that particular function is happening for red it's when it was being touched that area was getting activated the underlying assumption is that that part of the brain is responsible to process that kind of information so as you see that you know if you just look at the brain scan there doesn't seem to be a lot of difference between watching somebody getting you know hit and you hitting yourself perhaps that's how our empathetic system works now you can take it to another higher level also so here we are talking about you know something like the developmental scaffolding which show which says that uh, pretty much all our experiences learning 
perception and cognition everything is rooted in our sensory motor experience when we were young and that's one of the reasons why we have so many of these uh, tactile metaphors you know and um, in this experiment people were read out certain positive messages that were generally considered warm that is uh, one condition and in another condition they were touched with something warm so here again the area of the brain sort of has equal activation for both these conditions okay the middle insula the ventral striatum has same activation for social warmth and physical warmth also so this gives you more evidence to show that the tactile system is also dealing with metaphorical touch you know conceptual touch and things like that but um i think we should stop going in that direction and come back to another level where we are going to talk about the skin now right in terms of physical touch what is our organ uh, our organ for touch is the skin for some it is whiskers like these rats you see these whiskers these rats are nocturnal they are walking around in the dark burrowing here and there and pretty much their world view is through their uh, whiskers this fine animal is called the star nosed mole look it has fingers okay these are its fingers but it also has this ugly appendages around its nose these are almost like fleshy whiskers you know they work like fingers they go and they are also burrowing animals so they go and touch the ground and they feel the prey and then they eat them they prey on small insects in fact this paper this nature paper showed that these animals have one of the fastest feeding rate meaning the moment it touches a prey to the time it takes to put in the mouth it's one of the fastest i think i think in 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 the, uh, in the time range of around 20 milliseconds or something like that um this animal is the naked mole rat this is found in um the deserts of africa they are completely blind they have these little um uh, incisors in front and they have these huge uh, whiskers coming out of their body that's how they feel that's how they construct the world around them they only care about touch so we will look at how their brains are organized when we are going to look at how our brains are organized to perceive touch so we have still not shown you skin i only shown you the whiskers and the nose so let's now go to skin this so basically there are two kinds of skin hairy skin and non hairy skin it's just a fancy word for non hairy skin but non hairy skin is not really non hairy they have these something called the velum hairs which are really really fine hairs so if you can see in this cheek you know you can find that sometimes in the back of your neck it, it, i mean this of, of course huge variation but any um any skin that is uh that that does not have these large hairs will have these tiny tiny almost this down like hair called the velum hairs but there are really non hairy skin also they are the palms of your hand the soles of your feet your lips nipples and some genital areas are the ones that have completely no hair okay um so what is the difference really between uh, so this is the cross section of a skin this is the surface this is deep inside and what really is the difference between the hairy skin part and the non hairy skin part not really a lot except that as you can see there are hairs that are placed here and there is something that is connecting them to the sensory neuron apart from that there is a sweat gland here there is a sweat gland here and then uh, this is the dermis and this is the epidermis we'll look at it in detail in a in a, in a little bit manner uh, sorry in in a little uh, in a little while so there is 
really not much of a difference except for that there is this hair and it probably has some sensor here because you're able to feel touch through the skin uh, through the hair sorry so uh, let's look at this part in detail uh, not so much detail um, so the outermost um, surface of the skin has all your uh, microbiota there it has all this fungi bacteria they're not infections i'm not talking about an infectious state but even in their normal condition so uh, the epidermis has this bunch of cells and they rejuvenate every 30 to 40 days and the funny thing is that the dividing cells are in the bottommost area and then as they mature they will go up and the old cells either flake off and fall or they actually become this flattened sort of surface on top so that you're protecting the rest of these soft material you need some kind of a you know it's almost like a you know plastic sheet to cover your vehicle right you need something to cover your skin um so let's now look at the dermis part from here it becomes not just the skin cells but these are immune cells right if suppose some bacteria or virus comes in through this these guys have to fight them so those are these one two three four five different kinds of cells that's like any other part now what is interesting is that this is a merkel cell and we will figure out what that cell does in the subsequent slides um, one more thing that I want to point out is, can you see these undulations here, right? In the non-hairy skin, the glabrous skin, you have some kind of ups and downs. What are these? These are actually the fingerprints, okay? So this is a typical fingerprint impression using ink and the funny thing is we do not know what it what its functions are you know people tend to believe that there are grips that it gives that it's it's better for that but i have known some people who have you know who have no uh, fingerprints and they had trouble with other and uh, they're able to you know grip things and live a normal life um another interesting thing is that we are not the only animal to have um fingerprints in fact this fingerprint does not belong to humans although non human primates you know apes they all have fingerprints theirs are completely different from us but our fingerprint is very very identical to one particular animal and this is actually belonging to that animal and the animal is the koala nobody knows why if a koala walks into a crime scene the police are going to be super confused because its fingerprints are exactly the same as humans so to solve the mystery of what these fingerprints do um, there were some studies that were done uh, this is an interesting paper from 2017 where they talked about this uppermost layer you know this layer the stratum corneum which are the the dead cells so they um, so how they create grip is that they have to be moistened. They have to be moistened by the uh, by the sweat glands on the surface of the skin. But when you use a slippery glass surface, it takes some time for the uh, grip to be formed. But in the rubber surface, the grip is formed much faster. And that's what uh, was shown in this study that the moisture retaining ability and the um, the moisturizing ability of the topmost surface of the skin is much faster on these rubber grips and so you're able to get a good grip over the fingerprints uh, this doesn't really tell you whether the grip was better or not it just gives you that uh, two different categories of um, uh, surfaces have less and better grip that has nothing to do with the fingerprints um, another interesting thing is uh, is this kind of a wrinkling uh, phenomena happening on the on the surface of the skin so if you ever watched formula one whenever it rains that's it they stop the car and they have to change the tires into this waterproof 
you know they call it uh, rain tires i mean they spend millions and billions of money and they still haven't you know invented a tire that can work both in sunshine and in rain so people tend people think that this kind of a pattern of wrinkling could be a process by which the water drains away from the surface of the skin and it will add to the grip so this is again not conclusively proved that this is required for better grip or not but uh, the reason why i put it is that this is not a passive process which means that this wrinkling is not something like your cloth wrinkling you know if you soak it in water not like that this is actively controlled by the median nerve okay so if somebody's median nerve is cut and you soak that hand in water it will not get wrinkled in fact people use that the doctors use it as a very cheap diagnostic test to um uh, to detect if there is a right so um so till now we have been talking about aspects of touch which do not really require you know some kind of a neural transduction from the um, mechanical deformation changing into some kind of a neural signal and sending it to the brain okay so for that there are touch sensors on the skin there are five different kinds of receptors you don't have to remember it uh, there's no exam at the end of it the whole point of this is to tell you that look at the shapes of these cells they are shaped in such a way such so that they can extract different parts of the touch event from the skin okay so if you're touching a cup right you know the mug there's many different kinds of percept there's texture there's smoothness there might be micro slips it might be wet all of them might all of it is not going through a single pathway but they're broken down into different parts what that means is these merkel discs have the highest spatial resolution they are highly sensitive to points edges and curvatures that is this guy now the meissner's corpuscles are sensitive to abrupt changes in the shape of objects that occur at the edge or corners small irregularities on the surface that's the meissner's so the pecinian and see where the meissner's and merkel's are and the pecinian is very deep okay so they filter out low frequency uh, vibrations and their best response is to very high frequency vibration and they can even detect displacement of 10 nanometer so if you ever touched you know a bonnet of a car and you know felt the vibration or you know you touch the window and you feel it this all comes through the pecinian receptors now ruffini's endings they are sort of free endings they go and attach themselves to you know the muscles uh, sorry to the skin and then they are able to detect the sense of stretching so even if you move your finger your skin is going to be stretched and all that is being detected by the ruffini's ending and cross end bulbs are not well studied but they are found in you know sex organs and in the um, in, in in the mucous membranes and um so we forgot to look at the um hairy skin so if you look at the hairy skin detector so this is the hair and the bottom part which holds the hair into the skin has this ring of touch dome so really the hair does not have any touch sensors it is basically only the bottom which has the touch sensors it's almost like the skin is using the hair as a tool and we will come back to that in my last few slides so when i meant by uh, these different mechanoreceptors doing different part of the work so depending on the need of the function right different mechanoreceptors will decode according to their functionality now this is the braille which is how blind people read these are small indentations made using pins poked on paper and people will and the blind people can 
run their finger through and they can read these alphabets. Now, if you were to record just from these Merkel cells and reconstruct what kind of action potentials that they're sending to the brain. Action potentials are these electrical signals that uh, these neurons send to say that, hey, a touch event has happened. So when you reconstruct that, this is A, this is one dot, B is two dots, one below the other, C is one right next to each other. See the Merkel cells, if you look at just these decoding from the Merkel cell, you will be able to figure out the, um, you will be able to figure out the brain. But if you only use the Mersner's corpuscles, you will not really be able to, you can kind of figure out, but you will be confused. You probably won't be as fast as fast as you if you banked on the Merkel cells. And Ruffini's corpuscles, absolutely no. Pecinians, absolutely no. Because they pick up different kinds of touch sensation. So, um, so now we are going to correlate tactile acuity, which means how good are we to differentiate different kinds of uh, you know, tactile experience based on the density and the distribution of these mechanoreceptors. See how small the field of a Mersner's corpuscles is. So what this means is that one cell is responsible for touch on that small area, right? And here, Pacinian corpuscles, one cell is able to uh, detect touch on this entire area. So you really will not be able to differentiate a touch here or touch here, right? So your acuity will be very less. And this you can easily check using this test called um, two-point discrimination test. It's very simple. You take something like a divider, you no know, calipers, and then you check which is the lowest, which is the smallest distance that you can perceive as two different touches. Now, if you do it in different parts of the body, you will find that the threshold will be lowest for the fingers and then for the upper lip, cheek, nose, right? So within five millimeters, you know, less than five, just at five millimeters, you can differentiate them into two different points, okay? But look at where in the upper arm, shoulder and calf, if it takes 45 millimeters apart to be perceived as two different parts. Okay. So, um, so this can be directly correlated to the density of the mechanoreceptors in different parts of the uh, skin. And we will come back to it when we look at the brain. Um, so this is an interesting study that came in 2011, which tried to answer the question of gender. People tend to believe that women are better in tactile equity. And so they did this discrimination task and they found that the threshold for women were actually lower than for men. So it seems to confirm that, yeah, women have better tactile equity. But now the next question on why? Do they have more mechanoreceptors or what? So they did a lot of modeling of the data and they had indirect measures of you know the 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 density of mechanoreceptors and they found that the size correlated the best so this is the surface area of the finger and female fingers seem to be smaller than that smaller than male so these guys tend to believe that because you're packing a lot more mechanoreceptors in smaller finger women are able to have better tactile activity and men much less so. So obviously the next question is, women with larger fingers have lesser tactile equity than smaller, do children have better? Uh, those tests, I'm not sure if they're done, but for children they have done, but it's for children it's not just the tactile equity, they don't have the richness of experience, but there is definitely a decline in the density of mechanoreceptors and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the softness of our skin as the uh, age increases. So, so we have now tried and um, correlated different functions based on the first level of the somatosensory system, which is at the level of mechanoreceptors, which are right at the surface of the skin. Now, what these mechanoreceptors have to do 
is to actually send information to the brain for perception to occur, right? So how do they send it? So this is where the receptor endings are. And then these axons will go. The cell bodies are in this place near the spinal cord called the dorsal root ganglion. And then these uh, axons will travel all the way up to, you know, here, the midbrain, the thalamus, and then to the cortex. And we will trace where it's going. So uh, it's interesting to note that these axons, when they're going up, they're all bundled into different nerves based on the functionality. And they have different conduction velocity. So they're very uncreatively named um, A alpha, A beta, A delta, and C. Now look at what C does. C sends only temperature and pain and itch. A delta sends only pain and temperature. A beta sends mechanoreceptors of the skin. And A alpha sends proprioception of skeletal muscles. Now, um, see the speed at which it's being sent. So your proprioception is sent at around 80 to 120 meters per second, but temperature is only 0.5 to 2 meters per second. And even touch is sent much, much faster, you know, 35 to 75 meters per second. So if I were to throw a hot potato at you, okay, you would catch it and you would feel, you know, the roundness of the potato only after some milliseconds will the temperature and pain reach and then only you will drop the hot potato if it is super hot the damage is already done to your skin so these velocities actually do matter in terms of how we uh, you know how the system is set up um, so all these nerves have to go from all over the body it has to enter the spinal cord and you know this probably comes from the toe this from the neck this from the in the hands and neck and then they go in and then they reach the brain and you see they are differently colored right the reason is they come from different parts of the body right and it seems very weird why is it that you know this particular nerve is coming and taking information from the hand wouldn't it be easier for this nerve to come and take from the hand it's much smaller right but that's the wrong way of looking at it. If you ask the person to stand like this, then it makes complete sense. This is some kind of a leftover of evolution. You know, we evolved this system to take touch information when we were, you know, walking on all fours, but now we are erect. Now, what is interesting is that you can have diseases that would just attack one dermatome. So this one stripe, right, will be taking an in information about touch through one dorsal root ganglia and sending it to the brain. Now, sometimes you can have viral infection in that uh, particular dermatome, and that's what is shingles. And you'd have this stereotypical pattern, and doctors can just look at where these rashes occur, and they can figure out which dermatome is being affected. Now, uh, there's an interesting story. Freud looked at this kind of painful sensation. Sometimes women would complain about in their dermatomes. And he believed that it was something to do with the corsets that women were wearing and the underwear that they're wearing at that time. And he sort of misinterpreted it based on, you know, some kind of fetish and things like that. But uh, he didn't know that it was purely dermatomes. Okay. Now we have to go to the uh, next, I'm going to talk about, so these are the nerves that are all important nerves that are taking information from the periphery to the brain. Sometimes you can have, you know, clear cut or a lesion in these nerves, okay, which means that people will not be able to feel any pain. So if they were all mixed nerves, then some kind of pain sensation would be spared. But unfortunately, you have two nerves that are sending information about pain. So this is a photo of a place called Norbetten in Sweden. And back in the late 19th century, there were a curious case of a lot of people in this village not being able to feel any pain. 
Okay, so it's pretty isolated village, and they had some kind of mutation, and I'm, I'm sure there was interbreeding, and so this recessive mutation became dominant, and people could not feel any pain, surface or deep, and they couldn't even feel temperature. Now you might think this is a good thing, but it's totally not. So people would have fractures, and they would not know that they had fractures, and the bones would join in a very, you know. In, in not a proper manner, and they had these crippled hands and these small cuts and lesions that they would not pay attention and which would just become very infected and things like that. So uh, when they did the nerve biopsies, they showed that they had a moderate loss of A delta and C fibers. Now let's go back and look what the A delta and C. So this is A delta, pain and temperature, pain, temperature, and itch. So if these nerves are cut, they would not feel any of these sensations. But their proprioception and their touch was pretty normal. Okay. Now, the exact opposite happens in something called acute sensory neuropathy, where your alpha and beta nerves are damaged. So this is, I think, much more scarier because you don't have any sense of your body in space. You cannot maintain posture. You don't even have a sense of agency of your own body. Okay. And you obviously can't touch and feel anything. And this is a very, very rare disease. And um, Oliver Sacks actually writes a very eloquent chapter on this called The Disembodied Lady in his book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And since we're talking about pain, um, I just want to talk a little bit about itch because itch is a special kind of a touch sensation uh, because there is no mechanical deformation happening. Okay. There's only a chemical reaction. So there's some kind of histamines that are released and you start itching. And people also consider it as a mild version of pain, but pain can be even internal. You can feel pain in your stomach or your intestines, but you do not feel itch inside. It's only on the surface of your skin. And you have an, you know, your tendency is to tickle it or scratch it and it's almost reflexive. Now, this seems very innocent, but there are certain diseases where you have chronic itch that would just not go away. One particular disease is called onchocerciasis, which is a parasitic roundworm. And this roundworm has bacteria in its stomach and it causes uh, this itching sensation. So, this is also called river blindness because if the parasite goes and attacks the uh, optic nerve, people get uh, blind. And this is very common in Africa. It was very common. Now they've controlled it. And the itching is so intense that people will have scars all over their body. And uh, you will thank me that I'm not showing one of those photos. This is another form of chronic itching. Uh, and in in this river blindness disease, it's horrible that you know these calves get infected and people were uh, were living separately from their family and they were ostracized, and they would have high amount of um, depression because of ostracization, and also insomnia because they would not be able to sleep because of this itching, and many of them commit suicide. In fact, um, itching is depicted as the eighth hell in Dante's Inferno. This is a painting of um, William Blake. And here people are punished for forgery and things like that uh, by you know suffering from eternal itching. There's only one more level of hell that is worse than itching. So you can imagine how horrible it can be. And uh, this is a paper published in 2002 where this woman had shingles in her face. And after the single shingles episode, she started developing this persistent itch. The itch was so much that she scratched her skin away, scratched through her cranium and went and reached her brain just with her fingers. And she went to the hospital in Boston complaining of a greenish liquid dripping on her head, which was actually her cerebrospinal liquid. So if you look at the MRI, I see the break in the in the um, cranium. So now I think it, give, it gives you a sense of how intense this itch can be, that people are willing to scratch through their cranium. OK, so we've, we've talked a little bit about pain and itch. Now let's continue this path 
and trace it all the way up to the cortex. So from the finger, you are going to go up to the cortex. The cortex is um, sort of where all this fancy computations happen, where this high level perception happens. So the main area for the touch information to come and uh, reach in the brain, in the cortex for the first place is called the primary somatosensory area. Uh, it's some it's called s1 or area 3b and you see you know the, it, it's so you know this is the nose this is the front of the brain back of the brain so this is right in the middle in the strip of cortex so if you pull out that strip and you open it up diagrammatically of course you will find that there is not just one area but there are four different areas you know, one, two, three, a, three, b, and this corresponds to the kind of information that mechanoreceptors were sending up, right? Light touch, proprioception, deep touch, all those are separately arranged. And look how it is arranged in a very stereotypical manner. This is almost like the 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 uh, you know a label line hypothesis, as you call it. So all the nerves from shoulder would come and you know, synapse here, they would come and um, make a connection here. All the nerves from the forearm would come here. All the nerves from hand will come here. All the nerves from neck. Then these are the fingers. One, two, three, four, five. One is thumb and then the eyes. So there is a map of the human body represented in the cortex by virtue of it getting connections from the mechanoreceptors from the skin of that area. Now, one quirk, if you notice, is that look at how much elbow and arm and shoulder are having real estate in this and look at how much the fingers are having, right? So fingers are our main um, uh, touch organ. So we have higher acuity, more mechanoreceptors, more nerves coming in from there. And so the computations also are going to be heavy. So this is a larger area representing the fingers than any other part. Now, if you calculate this area and you draw a human according to the amount of real estate devoted to that body part in the cortex, you will find the diagram something like this. Enlarged lips because uh, look at this lips, lower lip, chin has a huge representation because we need to sense our food, right? We need to figure out that we're not easy eating stones and poison and stuff like that. And look at this, the hand is huge because we touch everything with our hand. So now um, this is only in the primary somatosensory area. I don't want you to be misled that there is only this area. There's a huge bunch of network of areas, parietal areas five, seven, and somat secondary somatosensory cortex, which goes to areas like amygdala and hippocampus, which take care of emotion and memory. And this is the most simplified diagram I could uh, diagram I could find because uh, the network is scarily complex. And all I want you to remember is that once the initial processing happens here, it is being sent to different areas for further processing for us to have this, you know, magnificent perception of touch. Now let's just quickly look at how this homunculus of other animals are. The, this is the desert rat that I showed you. And this, this pie diagram shows you the amount of cortex devoted to each area and it's drawn accordingly that, according to that. Its incisors have the largest amount of representation and look at all these hairs, they're hugely drawn because this is how it feels the world and it bites through everything in the sand. Now let's look at the star-nosed mole, right? So this is the real size of its appendages and see how enlarged it is in the cortex, just like our fingers. It shows that this is the primary touch organ that it has. Now rats also have these whiskers, right? This is the whisker pad and they have this one-to-one -one connection. They have this exact representation of their whisker pad in their somatosensory cortex. They call them barrel cortex. So this is also hugely disproportionately larger than, you know, the ear or the hand because for the rats, the whiskers are its primary somatosensory organ, just like our hands here. Now, the moment you have these maps in the brain, right, then you can ask the question of 
are these maps static or can they change okay so this is like a huge concept that basically came out uh, you know from somatosensory and visual studies that these maps are hugely plastic it's it's kind of puzzling because neurons are uh, they don't divide in adulthood you know after adolescence there's only very small percentage of stem cells and new cells being formed so people were sort of rigid in their idea that these maps are immutable but this is mike merzenich from ucsf who did these experiments where so this is the this is how the hand of this owl monkey would look like owl monkey is this small little primate from central america and this is the brain of the owl monkey and this is an enlargement of its somatosensory cortex so you see each digit is represented as d1 d2 d3 d4 d5 just like in the map now what these guys did was they cut off the middle finger okay now what happens is that this d2 and d4 which are the neighboring fingers that representation sort of grew and they merged so this was one of the first instances of maps changing in adulthood that too after a finger amputation like what was really happening and then they did further experiments where they trained these monkeys to detect some kind of a stimulus using their d2 and d3 that is the index in their middle finger so they were supposed to touch something and you know figure out if it was rough or something like that what it means is that there is a lot more taxing of that finger area and that finger representation they're using that part of the brain and when they looked at the brain that area got expanded so this is also very puzzling right you keep learning unlearning different things and how can the brain actually change and you know expand its area and shrink its area based on your everyday performance so this gave rise to the idea of the cortex or even the entire brain being very plastic such that you know you can basically change the representation within a day you can you know if you are an expert you know piano violin player especially you you'll have extreme acuity and a, and a very large representation of your fingers of your left fingers in the brain the right finger is not so much because you're using the book so um this is so this idea is what was invoked to explain the phantom limb sensation so vs ramachandran in his study he showed that people with amputation um they could still feel their uh, hands even though they were not there okay so this was known for ma many many years you know from world war 1 people were going crazy because you know after amputation you'd have intense pain and intense feeling of it being you know twisted and wrong and people would just sometimes the pain is so much that they would do a further amputation slightly higher just so that you'll they will get some kind of a pain relief so what he did to this person with this amputation was he took this cotton bud wet it and he touched the chin and the cheek and the person said that their phantom thumb and phantom limb was being touched so here it seems like the information processing in the brain in this chin and the face area is somehow mixed up with the hand representation right so that was the hypothesis and this was proved using uh, a lot of monkey studies so if you notice in the somatosensory area you have the hand finger face representation lip representation this is in a normal human where you would get information from face going here and information from finger going here so here what happens is that the information from the hand is missing just like here the hand is missing so the neighboring is taken over here what is neighboring is that face area is taken over okay so so that is why you are having this mixture of uh, perception of touch on this face area and in the phantom hand also this assumes that that even though you lose your hand you have some kind of a body schema by which you are able to perceive the hand just by activation of these neurons so these brain maps are very interesting in terms of um, how were you train it it will change 
so the toes in normal people they do not have a really distinct sort of representation like fingers here because we mostly don't use toes for you know you know great purpose we just put them into the shoes and we walk they they are stabilizing our our gait and our posture but when people like this who unfortunately don't have any hands they start training toes and they have amazing tactile acuity and functions with their toes and so when they scan the brains of these extreme toe users they call them you know extreme foot users they found that there is a somatotopy of each of their toes just like a finger representation in their brains so the point here is that the tactile system just like any other system is amenable to change and training and the brain also is so malleable that it allows all these things to happen so um i don't want to say that this happens only in the tactile system so i am going to show you a couple of studies from the visual system so here uh, when people go blind what happens to the visual system right um will the visual system be used for reading braille that's the question and that was shown in a classic paper in 1996 itself that these were congenitally blind people and this is their brain scan and they were asked to read braille and if anybody knows their neuroanatomy this is the back of the brain where the visual part of the brain is the visual brain activates for uh, for tactile sensations and more recently they did a more involved study where they asked people to read braille and they asked people to do some kind of a categorization task and uh, orientation discrimination task and all of that can be handled by the visual cortex what that means is is not just over training in braille that takes over the visual cortex for tactile processing but also new tasks and acuity so it's not just a training effect that the entire visual cortex can be taken over for tactile functions as well okay so we have come till the cortex we talked about the primary sensory uh, primary somatosensory area we also alluded to a few um, other areas that are functioning but but people generally ask where exactly does perception happen right so the easy answer is it's distributed it's all over the place okay but the importance of a particular area can be determined by injecting current into that area and to see if animals and humans actually perceive instead of the event that is going to happen externally okay suppose you are asked to detect vibrations like in this monkey the monkey is supposed to detect this vibration with the hand here and this vibration and it is supposed to pull a key to indicate whether the second one is a high frequency or low frequency right it's a very simple task we can do it monkey can do it but what these guys did ronaldo rumo from mexico did this classic study is after he trained the monkey instead of giving this second vibration in the hand he started injecting current in the hand area of the somatosensory cortex you know at the same frequency which would code for this vibration so if he gave high frequency vibration the monkey would perceive it as a high frequency touch the monkey wouldn't know okay monkey doesn't know that you are it's going to be stimulated there but it is able to perceive right it is able to perceive this activation of the cortex as a real stimuli and it would push or pull the button so I'm just going to switch on the so um this is a big boon for brain machine interfaces where um people have access to sensory information but they're not able to make any movements okay so in this experiment in 2009 they have um trained this monkey to do a discrimination task that is the monkey has to move the joystick and move this ball to the left or right 
and for it to move left or right the decision is being made based on the vibration given on this joystick okay so if you get a high frequency vibration you'll always move to the right if you get a low frequency vibration you always move to the left that's the task that they've designed as the monkey is trained now you have more sophisticated ways of stimulating the s1 so this is the somatosensory area look this is the d2 d3 d4 d5 different finger representations and these red dots and gray dots are all electrodes where they can inject current so then what they did they had this closed loop system where you would inject current into the monkey's brain and that monkey would perceive it as a proper command that you are giving in the hand and it will move to the right so this kind of technology people are experimenting with to implant in uh, locked in patients who are paralyzed and if they can get some kind of a feedback and they can you know they can just use uh, their eye movement or perhaps um, uh, you know maybe they can sort of move the cursor to the left or right using their brain signals or they can also have a channel of communication through different um, current being stimulated in the somatosensory cortex and of course this field is fast evolving and there is a new technique called optogenetics in 2013 they did this um, coding of active somatic sensation revealed by illusory touch how did they cause illusory touch was instead of putting electrodes and injecting current they are able to um, activate specific cells in the cortex using laser light and the rat perceives it as though a real touch has happened okay so um so this sort of takes it almost to the sci-fi realm of giving artificial touch without giving real touch and that can be given as a feedback for um brain machine interfaces so i'm coming to the how am i doing on time Is the moderator there I'm left with 10 minutes. I'm left with 10 minutes or I overshot by 10 minutes? Uh, so the session will be ending in 10, 10 minutes. Yeah, I just have a couple of slides. So shall I go forward with the slides? Uh, sir, I think if you're left with just one or two, okay, we'll have, we'll have questions as well. Okay, okay. So I didn't hear you there. What should I do? Sir, uh, if you can finish it off in like one or two slides, it's fine. We have questions. Absolutely. I'll just take five more minutes. I just have two slides. So, okay. So, we talked about touch, a little bit of tickle, and, you know, all kinds of stories in there, and poke. So, I wanted to bring the idea of tools being embodied by the somatosensory system. So, if you look at um, the evolution of human, one of the biggest evolution evolutionary uh, milestone was of course language you know the neocortex and the thumb the opposable thumb was hugely important for our cultural evolution okay we were able to do things like napping napping you should watch videos on youtube on na napping napping with a k so you tap into stones and you make uh, weapons, you make arrowheads, you, had, you make spearheads, and then you're able to change the environment around you. All this cannot happen if the somatosensory system and the motor system has this fast feedback loop with material things around us. Okay, Not a lot of animals can use tools. Some apes, uh, some uh, great apes can use tools pretty rudimentary our macaque monkeys can use tools some um, fishes use corals as tools and the, the crows the cor the corvids actually use a lot of tools but nothing as sophisticated as mostly because of the evolution of our opposable thumb we have some of the strongest thumbs in the animal kingdom we are able to manipulate so many things and we also effortlessly use any tool to feel the world around us. Like the blind person can walk around the city, they can differentiate so many textures. And the reason is that somehow our sensory motor system is able to incorporate the tools. Okay. 
How does it do it? Is that tools change the touch neurons properties and the tools get incorporated in the brain's representation. So I'm just going to quickly show you a couple of studies. This pretty much started the whole idea of embodiment of tools done in 96 by Iwamura. So he was recording from these bimodal neurons. Bimodal neurons are neurons that respond both to touch and to vision. Okay. Suppose you want to reach a cup, you need both the eyes and your touch to do this function. So these neurons are known for this you know, grabbing function. So first the monkeys were asked to grab something in front of them and the area which would activate you know, touch or light, uh, uh, you know, light beams would uh, activate neurons only from this small area. But when the monkey was given this rake and asked to reach for a further area, these neurons would also respond for the rake. So this was very fascinating. It's pretty much opened up the entire field of looking at how your brain is representing tools. Now, if the monkey is just passively touching, it will not expand this receptive field. So similarly, uh, a, a neuron, this is called a proximal type neuron. This, this accounts for touch in our peripersonal area, the area around our body. Once it's starting to use a tool, you're actually expanding the scope of our um, touch and the brain also, the neuron also changes its receptive field to the area around it. So this started a lot of studies and it shows that, you know, tool use changes the brain very fast within a few trials and the huge networks of the brain incorporate these tools. But how exactly is this happening? Um, this one last study I want to highlight is that when we use tools, we are just not using it to sort of feel using the tip of the tool. We're not distalizing the information, nor are we projecting, nor are we getting touch information just from where we hold and somehow the information is being projected from the tip to the to the place where we are holding. The entire tool is embodied. So how so in these experiments, what they did was they asked people to hold a stick and then they gave taps to the stick at different locations. And without looking at it, they were able to figure out which was a further tap and which was the closer tap. Okay. So it's like the tools are sensory extensions of the body. The tool users could accurately sense where the object contacted the wooden rod, just as it was possible on the skin. And not just that, the rod only vibrated for 100 milliseconds and the people could, or not the people, the skin, I mean, people, yes, the, could decode the touch by just, by 20 milliseconds of the vibration, they were able to detect where the vibrations was coming from. So, if you think about it, when I showed you the hair um, um, picture, the hair comes in and the touch sensors are only in the bottom, right? It's almost like the hair is an artificial stick that has been stuck in. And people have done studies with artificial sort of, um, you know, uh, fibers stuck into this, um, into the touch dome, which can also detect the movement of which way the, uh, the, the hair is moving. So similarly, we are also using a stick as though it's an extension of the somatosensory body. Uh, I cannot think of any other system that can so integrate external objects so fast and extend, you know, its sensory capabilities like the somatosensory cortex. And this it reflects a pre-neuronal stage of mechanical information processing just like your spider web. So the spider web is also not, uh, so, uh, you know, spider web is an extension of the body of the spiders. The spiders have these pressure sensors in their legs. And there are some uh, um, prey that get caught on distal part of the nest or sometimes close by, sometimes there is even a parasite which mimic a prey all these can be detected through the vibrations that is transmitted through the web. So here, 
the spider is basically extending its cognition to outside the nervous system also and every time we use a tool like your mouse you know and nowadays we have these haptic devices where you can touch things on the screen we're able to scroll up and down there's a little hand button from the pdfs all, all that or all those are tools and we effortlessly use these tools to extend our sensory capabilities and that's because the somatic sensory system is formed in such a way so there is not a lot of information on how these tools are being integrated in the somatic sensory system and that's also one of my research interests so i want to end with this confusing um quote by don hill he's a philosopher of science and he talks about touch especially touch when you sit in a couch so he says that i find the cloud like couch experience so vague that there is no clear distinction between me and where i end and where the couch is the inner and the outer the subject and the object are here not at all clear and distinct so here he says that a simple touch event on the back of his body sort of transformed into some kind of an experience where he cannot differentiate between what is being touched and what was touched and i hope that this convinces you that the tactile system is really rich and a lot of not a lot of concepts are actually studied uh mostly because there are only very few people studying around the world if you compare it to visual and uh, you know hearing systems and i think i will end with this and uh wait for questions i don't know how it's done thank you so much sir the session was indeed very thought provoking and i can't hear you very good informative session So we have one question. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Hmm. Oh. Sir, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, but uh, it's not very clear. Okay, sir. So we have one question. Huh. Um, is the extent of plasticity and the threshold at which it occurs differ for different sensory stimuli? I'll repeat the question: huh. Is the extent of plasticity and the threshold at which it occurs differ differ for different sensory stimuli? Sensory stimuli. Okay. Um. Yes, definitely. So I'm gonna assume that you are asking about um when you say different sensory stimuli. So plasticity can occur. uh because of multiple reasons it can happen because of injury you know the brain is damaged the hand is cut or you blind or it can happen because you are put in an enriched environment where you have a lot of toys to play around as opposed to not and plasticity can occur because you are learning piano okay so these different kinds of plasticity work on multiple time scales okay and also multiple underlying functions it also depends on when it happens there's something called a critical period plasticity which happens in early childhood where the brain is much more plastic the adult plasticity has a slightly different mechanism all right so it definitely depends on the kind of input it depends on the kind of uh, intensity and the modality did that answer the question thank you so much sir for the session and i yeah. thank all the viewers um, and thank you sir for the wonderful session thank all you right. so much and we'll meet you thanks for inviting me